The year is 1999. That sentence brings me back to my senior kindergarten class when I was five years old. We used to read out the date on the blackboard every single day. The year 1999 exists as a stain on my mind, a memory that will not go away no matter how hard I try to forget it. 1999 marked the year I lost my first tooth. It was also my first time on a plane. But unfortunately, the number 1999 serves as a reminder of the year that I lost my childhood innocence. That one memory that refuses to be wiped from my brain began with an old secondhand TV. At the time, Pokemon was the latest fad to hit the school. Pokemon cards, games, stickers, and most popular, the TV show. So of course, every time I came home from school, I would stay glued to the TV in our living room until Pokemon came on at 5. The only problem was that my dad watched the news at 5.30 and Pokemon episodes were back to back. That meant I had to miss an episode every day, which is something I whined on and on about. I'm sure my dad got tired of hearing me complain every day. That must be why he went and bought another TV. My dad put the new secondhand TV in my room. It was nothing special. Just an old, small boob tube with rabbit ears. It only had a few channels available, 20 to be exact, but none of those included the channel Pokemon was on. I guess I didn't really care though, I was just thrilled I had a TV in my own room. After surfing through the channels, I came to the conclusion that only Channel 2, TVO Kids, was worth watching, so that was my go-to for a while. But a few months later, I discovered Channel 21. One day in April, I was flipping through the stations, chancing my arm, trying to see if Pokemon was perhaps on a different channel. I pressed two and one on the remote, hoping for an extra channel that I might have overlooked. And to my surprising delight, there was. My dad was kind of surprised too, but he let me watch it because it seemed to show harmless programs for children. I was just excited that I found a hidden channel. The channel was called Caledon Local 21. I later found out that it was indeed broadcasted from the town of Caledon, Ontario, a place not far from my city. The shows I saw on Caledon Local 21 looked pretty poorly made. I never really understood what was going on half the time. However, as I grew up, every time I thought of that channel, I realized more and more how messed up the shows were. I began to ask myself, what the hell had I been watching? The following is a list of shows and episodes I remember on Caledon Local 21. How I remember such detail even disturbs me, but I guess things like this stand out in your mind for a while. The channel only ran a few shows, probably because it was only operational between 4pm and 9pm. Anyway, here's some things I remember. April, 1999. Mr. Bear's Cellar. Episode 12. Very sketchy name if you were to look at it nowadays. The show featured a guy wearing a bear mascot costume who would get a new visitor to his cellar every day. It was always a kid. The show was filmed with a camcorder, and not a very good one either. Later on, the police asked me a lot of questions about this particular show. The episode started with Mr. Bear sitting at a table playing checkers by himself. He kept doing that for a while until there was a knock on the door. The camera then cut to looking up the stairs at the door. And after that, another knock. Mr. Bear climbed the stairs and opened the door to reveal two young children. One was a boy about my age and the other was a girl that looked about eight. Mr. Bear danced with joy and then started talking to the kids at the door. I couldn't really hear what they were saying very well, or maybe I just don't remember. But what I do remember is that Mr. Bear led the kids into his cellar, which was quite dark and only lit by a small oil lamp on the table. I can't really remember much else about that episode except him singing a song, but 
I couldn't hear that very well either, probably because of that large bear mask. The episode ended with them playing hide-and-seek, the kids hid in a closet, and the show faded to black with Mr. Bear counting. May 1999. Soup and Spoon. I don't think this was even a show. I think it was supposed to be more of a special movie type of thing. All I know is I stopped watching Kaladin Local 21 for a while because I kind of thought this show was stupid, and Pokemon came on at 4.30 instead of 5, so that captured my viewing priority. I really don't remember that much of Soup and Spoon, but the episode showed a can of soup and a spoon. Both were attached to strings, swinging back and forth as if someone was holding them and dangling them in front of the camera. Interestingly enough, the show was shot in a basement which looked just like the one used in Mr. Bear's cellar. Like I said, I don't really remember that much, but one thing I can remember clearly was the end of the episode. The entire show was only half an hour. It wasn't that interesting. It included a lot of stuff I just found stupid, like Spoon chasing the soup around trying to eat him. But the ending showed a table with about seven kids sitting around it. Each of the children had a bowl of soup sitting in front of them. They were all sitting looking at the camera, but they had confused or almost frightened looks on their faces. The cameraman then held the can of soup in front of the kids and said, Spoon! ready and then the episode just stopped july 1999 it was summer and i hadn't seen channel 21 for a while then one day when i slept over at my friend's house i decided to check it out again my friend had gotten a tv for his room on his sixth birthday so we stayed up very late well very late for us 9 30 p.m to be exact either way we watched TV until it was bedtime. That's when I remembered Channel 21 and brought it up to my friend. We decided to see if it was on. To our surprise, it was. I thought they must have changed the broadcasting time like Pokemon. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 23. This episode was entertaining for my friend and I, mainly because it had swearing. Now when I think about it, I realized something was definitely wrong when it was filmed. The episode started with the camera on its side. It was facing Mr. Bear. He was walking upstairs to the cellar door. The camera then blacked out for a second before fading back in. It was upright and facing Mr. Bear. There was also another kid talking to him, but this kid looked about 11 or 12. He and Mr. Bear spoke for a while, but again, I couldn't hear them very well. I blame the crappy camcorder, but suddenly the kid started raising his voice. He was saying how it was late and he and his sister had to go home. I could hear several more young voices in the background, and I clearly remember Mr. Bear telling the preteen boy, Get the fuck out. You're not invited. With a deep voice muffled by the bear mask. I remember my friend and I looking at each other and laughing at the mention of the forbidden F word. But as the episode went on, things just got weirder and weirder. The angry young boy began climbing the stairs before turning around and telling Mr. Bear that he was going to call the cops. And that's when Mr. Bear suddenly broke into a run towards the kid, who started screaming and running as well. Then the camera cut out, and that was the end of the episode. The channel turned to static shortly thereafter. August 1999 I didn't really want to watch Channel 21 anymore after that last episode, but for some reason, in August, curiosity drew me back to Mr. Bear's cellar. The last episode I saw of Mr. Bear was weird and had swearing. It made me think that maybe the show was made for teenagers. Nevertheless, I flipped on to Channel 21 when my dad was busy. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 28 Apparently this episode had been playing the entire month of August. This episode was studied a lot by the police. The entire show was just Mr. Bear sitting in a chair talking to the audience. Hello kids! Do you want to visit my cellar? If you do, then please write me at this address. 
My television set then switched to a white screen with multicolored letters reading out the address. It stayed there for the rest of the episode, an episode which repeated for five hours every day until September came. And guess what I did? I sent Mr. Bear a letter. I did it out of curiosity, mostly. My dad was even okay with it because he thought it was a legit kid show. But he never saw any of what was on Channel 21. So I wrote a letter as neat as possible. I mean, I really took my time. I stated how much I wanted to meet Mr. Bear. Then my dad mailed the letter to the address on my screen. And to my surprise, I got a response. I still have the letter I received on August 15th. 1999. It reads, Dear Elliot, Thank you ever so much for your letter. I would love to have you in my cellar. We play games, watch movies, and go fire camping in the middle of the woods. You'll love it. Come to my house. I look forward to having so much fun with you. Love, Mr. Bear. I cannot believe my dad never found that sketchy. In fact, he actually took me to the house, and that's when the police became involved. Those endless questions, those pictures of terrified kids, and the forest. That brings me to why I'm writing this blog. That psycho and his friends did some messed up shit back then. And now, it seems he's trying to get in contact with me. The entire police investigation is coming back full swing. And that has brought 1999 back to me. It seems that over a decade later, it's all happening again. Update. November 14th, 2009. People have been emailing me asking me what exactly happened in 1999. And don't worry, I'll get to that. Those weird TV shows I was watching were apparently meant to attract kids to Mr. Bear's house. And what Mr. Bear did shocked the entire town. When my dad drove me to Caledon, to the address Mr. Bear left on the letter, we found a house that was on the outskirts of town, surrounded by open farmland. I still remember that house. It looked like an old farmhouse from the early 1900s. The windows were all boarded up, and the place looked in a dire state of despair. As we walked up to the house, I remember my dad checking the address over and over again and looking around in disbelief. Then, the front door opened. I expected Mr. Bear to be at the door, but I was surprised to see a police officer emerge from the creaking doorway. While the officer was talking to my dad, I quickly asked if this was Mr. Bear's house. The officer's face cringed slightly. Then he muttered, Oh God, or something like that. He carried on talking to my dad quietly so I couldn't hear. My dad told me to go wait in the car. After that, we just went home. Dad was quiet the whole way home. I knew something strange had happened. He never told me for a while, and in time, I forgot about it. Channel 21 no longer came on, and when I asked about it, my dad wouldn't even acknowledge its existence. I think I was about 13 when I learned the truth. I remembered Channel 21 one day and mentioned it to my dad. I guess he finally decided that I should know what happened. Caledon Local 21 was a local TV channel that ran from October 1997 to August 1999 in the Peel region of Ontario. The entire channel was produced from a house in Caledon and was run by a man who was not really known by anyone in the town. The house was the house I visited. The channel could only be accessed by older TVs because the signal was only picked up by rabbit ears. The man in the house created all the shows on the channel, all of which were kid shows. He was Mr. Bear, and he was also the mysterious cameraman. The real reason he created the channel was more disturbing than originally thought. As you might have already guessed, he kidnapped kids and held them in his cellar. But while most people thought he was a serial child molester, he really wanted to use those kids for another purpose. The day I arrived, 
The man had fled his house the night before. That was the day before the police went to their investigation. I wasn't the only one watching Channel 21. Update. December 2nd, 2009. Sorry for not answering questions for so long. I haven't accessed my email account for some time. Anyway, let me finally set things straight about what I know. Back in October, I visited the house previously owned by the man who ran Caledon Local 21. Two women lived there. They operate a daycare business. How ironic. Anyway, let me answer some of the questions you guys emailed to me. Question. Who else watched Caledon Local 21? Answer. I know other people watched it for sure, including those kids who wound up at Mr. Bear's house. After some Google searches, I found a few people on Neoseeker forums who were discussing shows on Caledon Local 21. They talked about the two shows I watched, but also another two shows I'd never heard of. A user named I Am Real Life seemed to know all of the shows that were broadcasted on Channel 21. Here are the two I'd never seen before. The Fallen Angel and Life I Am Real Life described it as a fairly boring show about a guy rambling on and on in front of the camera about how we must please Satan and appease him before it's too late. Then, there was Paint with the Soul. I Am Real Life and another user named Siggy92 were discussing this show. They described it as Blair Witch-like. It consisted of a cameraman wandering around the forest at night, doing nothing meaningful or remarkable at all. I'll look for the conversation and see if I can get a link. Question. Where is Mr. Bear, or the guy who wore the costume? Answer. If I did know, I would have told you earlier. I have no idea where that guy is. I don't know if he's dead or alive. Hopefully he's dead. When I see my dad's friend next time, I'll ask him about this. Maybe he can give me a more definite answer. Question. What did Mr. Bear do to the children? Answer. This is by far the most common question I've been asked. I found this out in October as well via my dad's friend, who's a retired Caledon regional officer. Apparently the man playing Mr. Bear took the kids out of the house and into the woods nearby. The police aren't sure exactly what he did there, but 16 charred bodies of children between the ages of 4 and 13 were found in a 15 by 15 foot ditch deep within the forest. My dad's friend didn't want to go into exact details, but I'll see him next Thursday anyway. Maybe I can extort more information from him then. That's all I have for now. Thanks for keeping an interest in my blog. I'll try to gather as much information as I can for my next post. I'm actually getting pretty interested in this myself. We all have a right to know exactly what the hell happened. Update. January 14th, 2010. I'm sorry I haven't posted anything for a while. To be honest, I kinda lost interest in this blog since it hit a standstill while looking for more information about the identity of the owner of Caledon Local 21. However, a few weeks ago, I struck gold. I found some answers surprisingly from the father of a kid I used to babysit. He lives just across my street. I used to look after his kids when they were younger. He currently doesn't have a job either. He used to live in the woods outside of Caledon. He witnessed the owner of the channel's activities out in the woods. His name is Anthony Paulo. He had a small bungalow in the forest. He would often venture into the woods to smoke a joint or two before returning to his work as a wood craftsman. Paulo said that sometimes he would hear the voices of children coming from deeper in the woods. He would also often see a glowing light off in the distance. Paulo told me these events started in late 1997. This apparently is around the time Caledon Local 21 began airing. Paulo became so intrigued by this happening that he actually went to investigate. He described what the whole scene looked like when he got there. There was a group of kids, he said about 13 to 17, aged roughly 5 to 12, they were gathered around a large fire pit with a burning fire. Standing with them was a single adult. Paulo talked to the man. He recalled his unusual appearance. He looked like a crack addict, very unkempt and constantly twitching. Paulo asked the man what he was doing out in the forest with the children. 
The man said they were on a camping trip and it was something they did frequently. Since Caledon had one of the lowest crime rates in Canada, Paulo didn't suspect anything. He simply left it at that and told them to be quieter. Paulo then paused for a while before telling me that they never became quieter. In fact, sometimes he heard loud chanting from the children in an unknown language. He never met the strange man again, and he relocated shortly after. I told Paulo that the man was probably the owner of Caledon Local 21, but he doubted it. He said he heard something about the man moving to Pickering. This was stated by several other residents in the area. But here's what I know now. The strange man would take the kids into the woods regularly for camping. The fire pit Paulo described just may be the hole that the bodies of the children were found in. And the children Paulo saw are probably the ones found dead. The man actually did move to a city called Pickering. It's a smaller city east of Toronto. I'll discuss this with my dad's friend, the ex-cop, and see if this matches anything the police knew about the man. I also want to see if he has any other knowledge about what was aired on Caledon Local 21. Update. February 10th, 2010. Good news, guys. I talked to my dad's friend, and he disclosed a lot of information. First, I asked him what the police knew about the man who ran Caledon Local 21. He says they've had the same leads for years and they've never found a suspect. However, the Pill Region Police do have some tapes found in the house Caledon Local 21 was broadcasted from, and he even let me watch a few of those tapes. I guess I haven't told you much about this guy yet. He's my dad's friend, and his name is Mitchell Wilson. He's a pretty nice guy. He seems to understand my thirst for knowledge on what happened during the late 90s in that house. He thinks it was wrong that my dad went so long without telling me the truth. Mitchell took me to the Davis Road Police Station. If you don't know what that is, it's the largest station in Caledon, and one of the largest in the Pill region itself. Each of the main stations around Pill have some of the Caledon Local 21 tapes. I was allowed to watch all the footage that the Davis Road Station has. Unfortunately, I couldn't take any of the tapes home for obvious reasons. Paint with the Soul, Episode 10, Garbage Thrown Away Paint with the Soul was one of the shows that I Am Real Life and Ziggy92 discussed on Neoseeker. I told the police about this and they informed me that 12 episodes of the show were made and they were broadcasted between December 5th, 1997 and January 8th, 1998. I Am Real Life and Ziggy92 described that the episode opened with the cameraman wandering around a forest. It appeared to be during the evening when the sun was setting. The cameraman walked along the path until he got to an area where there was a lot of garbage lying in the leaves. The camera looked around at the various wrappers, bottles, bags, and boxes, making sure each item got a few seconds of screen time. The camera then focused on a single area before the man spoke. I recall how he spoke in a very timid and quiet voice. I swore I'd heard it somewhere else before. On another Caledon Local 21 show, I thought. I could barely hear what he was saying, but mainly, he talked about how humans are garbage, and something that had to do with saving ourselves by cleaning up the garbage. It actually sounded really stupid, but still, a feeling of dread came over me. I mean... That forest was possibly where those bodies were found, right? Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 25 When the police administrator brought this tape in, I actually said, Oh shit, and chuckled out loud. Of course, I got stares from the staff, but Wilson explained to them about my little experience with Mr. Bear and how I kept the letter he sent me. Like the previous episodes, this one included a guy wearing a bear mascot costume. The episode began with Mr. Bear waddling over to the cellar door with a bottle of orange juice in his paws. On the ground, there were 16 shot glasses as well as a small bottle that contained an unknown liquid. Mr. Bear poured an equal amount of orange juice into each glass before opening the smaller bottle and depositing one drop into every glass. Then, Mr. Bear went off camera. There were some minor sounds kind of like someone shuffling and then suddenly Mr. Bear emerged from behind the camera's location. Following him 
were 16 children. Some of them looked as young as four. Others looked like they were practically teenagers. As the children entered, the police administrator commented that this is the only episode that showed all 16 victims. It was a heavy feeling to absorb. But to be honest, the kids all looked content except for this one kid who had visible bruises on his face. Unlike the other kids, he wore a more fearful expression. He also looked about 11 or 12, and that's why I recognized him. He was the kid who asked about his sister and subsequently met an unknown fate at the end of episode 23. That was the episode I watched in July of 1999. When I told the administrator this, he confirmed it was the same kid. He was also featured in episode 24, an episode that only aired once at 3 o'clock in July of 1999. The police still haven't found that tape. Suddenly, Mr. Bear broke into a song. He was singing about citrus fruits and how vitamin C was good for you. I could barely hear the lyrics as they were muffled by the bear mask. The kids all drank their juice, but I could tell the boy from episode 23 didn't want to. After that, the episode ended. After viewing the tapes in possession at the Davis Road police station, I was satisfied, but only temporarily. I mean, I still want to know the full story. But the police just keep giving me the same crap about the creator of Caledon Local 21 being nothing more than a fetish pedophile and apparent cultist. Anyway, I'm gonna sign off for now. Need to get into university first. I'll get more information later. Hopefully I'll get back to this blog as soon as possible. Update. May 8, 2010. Last month, I finally got my G2 license. In Ontario, Canada, this allows you to drive a car by yourself, and then after six months, you can even take passengers. Pretty exciting. I of course took full advantage of this and drove into Caledon for a little Sunday drive. Since I haven't updated this blog in a while, I figured I might as well visit the house where the infamous channel of my childhood was located. The house looked different than it looked when I saw it last October. The place was no longer used as a daycare, and instead, it just sat there abandoned. However, it did have a for sale sign showing that someone owned it, but they obviously wanted to get rid of it. The abandoned house drew fuzzy memories from my mind, mainly from that day that my dad took me to visit Mr. Bear. A feeling of dread came upon me. What happened to the children while they were held in Mr. Bear's house? I walked up the steps to the front door and peered through the window. Inside, I could see a nearly empty hallway with a few boxes at the end. At the end of the hallway to the right was an open door presumably leading to the kitchen. To the left were two doors, both apparently leading to the rooms visible through the windows outside. I wondered where the cellar entrance was located. Had it been sealed up? I wanted to find out. I walked around to the back of the house and found my answer. There were two wooden doors lying at an almost flat angle. They were padlocked shut. This had to lead to the cellar, I thought. My mind was racing. I didn't want to hang around, so I left the cellar area. Behind the house, the empty field continued on until it reached a dense forest that lined the horizon. I wondered if that was the forest where the bodies of the children were found. I thought to myself, fuck it, and proceeded to walk across the field behind the house into the forest. The forest was oddly quiet, except for the periodic sounds of a woodpecker drilling into a distant tree. I cautiously made my way deeper into the woods, not really caring about the fact that I had no idea where I was going. I don't know how to explain it, but it felt like there was something there that I needed to find. Eventually, I came to a thinner part of the woods. I could see a few small houses in the distance. Paulo's house crossed my mind, and I wondered if one of these homes had belonged to him. I neared a small clearing in which I could see three adequately sized logs gathered around a black, charred area. It was clear that a small fire had been lit there recently. Hey, get the fuck out of our fort! Those words nearly gave me a heart attack. I turned to my left and saw two dark-clothed people running towards me. 
My initial thought was to run. However, as they came closer, I saw they were just kids in their early teens. Probably 13 or 14. Maybe 12. I think they realized my size as well. I'm 6'1". Neither one of them were any bigger than 5'8". We said, get the fuck out. The larger one who was wearing a slipknot shirt said half-heartedly. I stood my ground and shrugged. The shorter one who was wearing a Metallica t-shirt swung out a butterfly knife and held it in my direction. No, you wouldn't want to. I said in a deep, serious tone. I was trying to sound as badass as possible. I pulled out my cell phone. The two kids withdrew. The one in the Metallica shirt put his knife away. Look, dude, we don't like people in our fort, so can you just go? Said the one in the Slipknot shirt. He was obviously intimidated. I had no business in the forest anyway, so I uttered out a simple, fine, and turned around. Then I realized I had a great opportunity. Hey, did either of you hear about a guy who murdered a bunch of kids in these woods about, mm, I don't know, 13 years ago? I asked the kids. The two looked at each other with confusion before the one wearing the Metallica t-shirt answered, Yeah, everyone knows about that guy. He said to me as if I were stupid. The kid in the Slipknot shirt continued, He still lives around here, in the storm drain. My big brother's friend says he saw him in a bear costume once. He was wandering around the forest late at night. My instincts told me this was probably a lie. I knew the owner of Caledon Local 21 was probably long gone and only existed as folklore in this smaller, isolated community. However, as a human, the thought of the mysterious unknown sparks interest within. Oh yeah, and where is the storm drain? I asked out of curiosity. I didn't actually believe the kid's story. The kid in the Metallica shirt stared at me for a few moments. His eyes were full of annoyance, but I could detect a hint of curiosity. You're not from around here, are you? Why did you even come here? He asked. Now, I do admit, I was slightly startled by the nature of his question. However, I figured I might as well explain why I was there. Just in case people mistook my intentions. I told the two kids about my experience with the man from Caledon Local 21. I told them that I came here to seek out some sort of closure, even though I wasn't exactly sure what that was. The kids seemed familiar with the channel as they smiled and looked at each other when I mentioned it. They also became more understanding and gave me a detailed description of how to get to the storm drain. Shortly after, I decided just to turn around the way I came and head back to the house, leaving the defensive kids to tend to their fort. Now, you're probably wondering why I left out the detail about what the kids told me. It's because I'm choosing to conclude what I have gathered now. Here's what the two teens told me in detail. The storm drain lies ahead of the kid's fort, the same direction I was heading. The drain ends at a small river, where access water is drained out. Near there is a small playground. The kids told me that people rarely use it. The man supposedly lives in a large pipe that rainwater drains out of. People have seen him. He's always wearing either a bear mask or the mask and a full body bear costume. Honestly, I don't believe this is true. In fact, I think it's simply a myth made up by the residents of Caledon. The story doesn't seem plausible in any way. Why did no one call the police? Did they not think that guy looked suspicious? Questions like these make me think this story's invalid. Either way, at some point I may visit the storm drain. Not because I believe the story, but because I want an excuse to visit Caledon again. It ensures this blog doesn't die. Because with no more tapes to watch, I don't know what to talk about anymore. Thanks for continuing to support my blog. I know many of you are looking forward to more information about what happened in Caledon during the year 1999. Rest assured that I'll do my best to continue my research into the topic. But for now, Elliot out. Update. October 7th, 2010. Wow. Nearly five months since my last update. I'm guessing everyone pretty much thinks I'm dead, right? Well, thankfully I'm not. But in all seriousness, I really have been busy the past few months. And a blog about something that could have killed me as a little kid was kind of low on my list of priorities. As of now, I'm living in Waterloo, Ontario. I'm attending the University of Waterloo for computer engineering. 
Yep, I'm a keener. As you can imagine, engineering is no walk in the park. And to be honest, I almost forgot about this blog. But, as you can see, I'm back. I remembered to visit the storm drain that the kids from the Caledon Forest told me about. It was out in a clearing between the wooded areas, right beside a marsh. I hate to burst your bubble, but unfortunately, I found absolutely nothing. Nothing other than a turtle that retreated into its built-in home when it saw me. I snapped some pictures of the pipe which I've posted as well. But let me tell you, it was not a storm drain like they said it was. What I saw was a simple pipe, possibly something used to channel the access water from the marsh. When I got back from Caledon, I just kept putting everything off until suddenly I forgot about my blog. I guess it just didn't seem important anymore. Please forgive me. It wasn't until recently that I became interested in this case again. On September 10th, I received an email from the following email address. Return the B at hotmail.com. Funny, am I right? Well, it gets better. This is the exact email I was sent. Dear Elliot, my dear, dear boy. You see, this story may or may not be true, but it could happen. There are many slots for airtime. If you have a little money, you can have a public access TV channel. Some public access channels share airtime with EWTN. It was a religious channel based out of Michigan. That shows Catholic-based programming, but during the off-air hours, they have independent shows or just a blue screen. Cable networks have empty channels available for rent. So the scenario of a pedo renting a channel on basic TV isn't far-fetched at all. However, public access to TV is widely reviewed and can be terminated at any time. These are the rules for the United States, not Canada where the story took place. So if this happened in the US, the pedo would be tracked and arrested immediately. Yes, this story could happen. But it's unlikely. 100 fuzzy hugs to you, Mr. Bear. Now obviously this letter is fake and it sounds almost corrupted. But still, I'd like to thank whoever sent it. They could use a spell checker and some English lessons. Just reading the letter creeped me out. But because of it, I'm now full of new interest to continue my blog. I guess it's just funny trying to pursue the mysteries I've always questioned. By the way... I have a roommate, and he knows all about this. He thought the letter was real and actually seemed more scared than I was for a second. But when I shrugged it off, he did too. I mean, what are the chances of it being real? How would Mr. Bear know all this about public access TV, and how would he know when I went to Caledon on those occasions? I mean, I suppose he could be reading my blog, and that's how he knows my email and the fact that I'm still interested in his cellar. I'm going to send a reply to return the bee at hotmail.com. Oh, wow. Looking at the email address, you can tell someone wanted to freak me out. It didn't really work, though. But whoever you are, thank you for sparking my interest back into the full matter. Maybe I can finally find out what happened to Mr. Bear. Although I don't believe the legitimacy of that email address, a part of me still feels anxious. Thank you to everyone who's still following me. I appreciate that some of you have become such avid fans. You are why I'm choosing to continue this. Thanks, guys. Elliot. Update. November 7th, 2010. Wow, I can't believe this blog hasn't been deleted yet. I haven't posted anything for so long. I have my reasons, and I'd rather not discuss them just yet, but... It has been a rather traumatic year for me. Some of you are right. I shouldn't have gone back trying to relive the mysteries of my childhood, but I just couldn't resist. It's been over a year since my last post, and a lot has happened. Let me recap where I am now with regards to the whole Mr. Bear incident. So, return the bee at hotmail.com is no longer in use. I mean, I guess... I tried replying to the email, but I got no reply back. I tried again recently, but still no response. I actually moved up to Ottawa, 
It's the capital of Canada for those of you who don't know. I moved up there to go to university, so I haven't been back to Caledon or back home in the Pill region for a while. I had my reasons for leaving, and I'm sure you can guess why. I had to make a new email account because people kept pranking me pretending to be Mr. Bear. Thanks a lot, guys. So, why have I ventured back to this blog? Well, remember my dad's ex-cop friend, Mitchell Wilson? He called me on October 23rd about a tape that was found in a branch of the Brampton Public Library. Brampton is my hometown, in case you haven't picked up on that yet. Mitchell claims he isn't allowed to discuss the contents of the tape with me as it's still evidence, but he did ask me to come check it out when I return home. The knowledge of a new tape has got my gears grinding again because we all know what was on the last tapes I saw. I can only imagine what could be on this one. Obviously it has something to do with Caledon Local 21. I guess I just wanted to say I'm continuing this blog and thank you to everyone who still follows it. I don't know when my next entry will be, but when I see that tape, I'll tell you what I find. I don't know what to expect, but I'm both nervous and excited to see another tape. I guess I'm interested in this whole mystery again. Elliot Update, January 21st, 2011 It's been a long year for me. University life has been giving me the usual sleepless nights, especially since I transferred to Ottawa, which is the place to party. That's sarcasm. But now I'm back home with my dad in Brampton, the town I grew up in. I got home on the 18th of December and have just been visiting with family. Or at least, that's what I wish I'd been doing. But now that festive holiday cheer that I normally have at this time of the year was absent. To answer the hundreds of emails and comments I got, yes, I did see the tapes that my dad's friend Michael Wilson promised to show me. These tapes, however, act as a curse. I just want to know more, yet I want to forget everything. I couldn't help it. I needed to see those tapes, not just for myself, but for all of you guys who are just as intrigued as I am about the ominous man in the bear suit from my past. But after viewing those tapes, I feel that pit of dread deep inside me once again, because I know all the kids in those videos are dead, and I realize that I could have been one of those kids. That part of humanity is a dark, dark place. If you haven't skipped this paragraph for the juicier details below, then I thank you for listening to my ramblings. On January 1st, I called Mitchell Wilson and asked if there was a time I could come by and view the new tapes. Things were pretty slow at the station because of a snowstorm, so he said I could come by any time that day. The tapes were located at a branch not too far from me, so I braved the slushy roads and terrible Brampton drivers as I made my way to the Pill Regional Police Station located at the Bramalea City Center. I met Wilson at the front desk where he then led me up to the second floor and into a small office. He instructed me to have a seat and wait while he went and got the tapes. Before leaving the office, he turned to me and said, But are you sure you want to do this? Of course I did. Or at least I thought so. Besides, Wilson's friend had pulled a lot of strings to get me in there and I didn't want to waste the opportunity. This particular station had two tapes on hand. I was only able to watch a few minutes of the footage, however, because... The second tape was apparently too damaged to be played on the VCR. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 30 Mr. Bear never ceases to disturb me, especially after what almost happened when I was younger. This episode took place outside in a forest at dusk. This made it slightly hard to see, especially considering the quality of the film, but that was a trademark of Caledon Local 21. The episode started with the camera being held in the paws of Mr. Bear. He was aiming it at himself. But that bear mask, it looked more sinister in the shadow of the trees. An unmistakable muffled voice spoke up. Hello children, today I will be doing a wonderful thing for my friends. 
I will be delivering them to a faraway land where they will surely be happy forever. Mr. Bear turned the camera around to show an ATV with an attached trailer. But what stood out the most was that the trailer contained seven motionless children lying side by side. Th this here is the first load, but more will be on their way soon. <laughs> Mr. Bear turned around and pointed the camera at the large burlap tarp spread out on the ground. He picked up the tarp revealing a large hole that must have been at least 12 feet deep and maybe about 15 feet wide. The rest of the episode consisted of Mr. Bear taking each kid and dropping them into the hole. I asked Wilson if the kids were dead, but he shook his head no and replied, Not yet. Soon, all the kids were in the pit. Some were in awkward positions due to being tossed in, but they all remained unconscious. The vitamin C will surely help these children on the great journey that awaits them. Mr. Bear mentioned as he panned the camera towards multiple bottles of gasoline beside a bush. The camera zoomed into the bottles as Mr. Bear hummed before the episode ended. Wilson revealed to me that these were seven of the sixteen victims found burnt to a crisp. Obviously the gasoline is what the man playing Mr. Bear used to light them on fire. A pit full of burning children. Who the hell would want to do that? The feeling of dread found me once again when I realized that I could have been one of those kids. Wilson then explained to me that he had previously lied. The other tape confiscated by the Bramalea police branch did indeed work. It contained footage of the actual burning. He said he felt like I wouldn't be able to handle the disturbing and graphic nature of the episode. And you know what? Maybe he's right. I don't want to see it. I think I'm satisfied for now. I just need some time to get myself together. The thing is, the man who ran Caledon Local 21 is still out there. More to come soon. Elliot. I-N-R-I. Once upon a time, there lived a boy named Elliot. Elliot was a clever boy who loved playing with his friends. One day he watched a lovely television show about a bear and his children friends. The children loved helping each other as good children should. But they also loved the bear. Mr. Bear. And the bear loved the children since they were so good at helping him and the fallen angel. The children and the bear wanted to play together forever with the help of their angel friend. <laughs> but the fallen angel needed even more help. <sighs> so the children had to give the ultimate sacrifice. Because that's what friends do, Elliot. They help each other. Help us, Elliot. Burn with us, Elliot. I want you, Elliot. He wants you, Elliot. Come back to my cellar. Pretty please with sugar and icing on top, Mr. B. I-N-R-I Update April 5th, 2011 I wanted to update more. I truly did. However, certain circumstances had turned me off the whole Caledon Local 21 thing. I've since then had hundreds of emails about my blog and was even contacted by a magazine about my story. But now is the time to come clean to everyone. Where have I been for an entire year? Well, the story of Pandora's box is true. And I opened it. I opened it when I watched the second tape in the possession of the Bramalea police branch. The other subject I'd like to address is the number of joke fake emails I've been getting from people claiming to be Mr. Bear. But let's start with the second tape, because that's what traumatized me the most and halted my interest in this case. After a few weeks of playing silent, I decided to ask Mitchell Wilson if I could view that infamous second tape he talked about. I don't know why it came up then, but it did. I guess I just felt like viewing that tape would give me some sort of closure. Wilson was obviously reluctant to show me, but 
I was persistent. He gave me an offer. If I was still interested by the time I turned 20, he would show me the tape. Not being able to do much, I just played the waiting game. By the time my 20th birthday rolled around, I was definitely still interested in viewing the tape. I gave Wilson a call, during which he admitted that he hoped I would forget about asking him again, but I was not taking no for an answer. You really want to see it, don't you? He asked me, but I needed to see it. I had to at that point. Sure enough, he invited me to the Bramalea branch one Monday afternoon. Having watched every Saw film and a video of an animal slaughterhouse in my ethics class, I was sure I'd be able to handle whatever the tape could throw at me. But how naive I was. Mr. Bear Cellar, Episode 31 When Wilson went to collect the tape from evidence, the officer in charge of the evidence room shook his head at me. His face said, What are you doing? Wilson explained that that tape was the last known episode from Mr. Bear's cellar. I rightfully assumed that I would be seeing the fate of all the children and immediately began to feel a sense of dread. The episode opened inside a forest, the same one from the previous episodes. It took me a while to realize it because it was night, and the trees and the leaves just looked like shapes dancing around in the darkness. A faint glow of light was present on the right side of the screen. There wasn't any audio, but it appeared to be a windy night. Slowly the camera began to pan towards the glow, revealing smoke rising from a hole, with the tips of flames peeking over the top. Wilson paused the tape at that point. Are you sure you want to see this? He asked me. I insisted on it, even though the voice in my head was telling me not to. The video continued. The cameraman moved towards the hole. It was a pit of fire. This was the hole I'd seen in the previous episode, only this time it was filled with shapes. I could see shapes moving around, fluttering, flailing, and some motionless. I knew damn well what they were. The camera began to adjust to the light, and I could see burning flesh, red, black, a blur of surreal movement and colors. I wish I could forget what I saw, but you can't forget a scene like that. It was horror reality. Human beings were being killed in a horrifying way. Kids. It was a fate that I could have potentially met. The video suddenly cut to dawn. The camera was now positioned further away from the hole. The fire had gone out but there was still smoke rising up. There was a figure up ahead. I recognized it right away. The Mr. Bear suit was laid on the ground. It was empty. It looked unnerving. The suit was laid out in the shape of a cross. The cameraman did a lap around the suit, treating it like a treasured artifact. Placed at the head of the suit was a sign. In bold red letters, I... N-R-I was printed. The cameraman moved back to the end of the suit, zooming into the bear's face, and that's where the episode finally ended. I was speechless. It was like a dream. A nightmare. You can find a whole lot of terrible things on the internet, but I had never seen anything like that. Wilson asked if I was okay, and... I replied with a shaky yes. I assured him as we left that I was fine and that the video gave me some closure over the whole incident. He didn't seem too confident about my words, but he left it at that. He was right, though. I had nightmares for weeks. I gave up. I didn't care about the whole thing anymore. A sick man burned a bunch of kids alive. He attracted them using a fake kid's TV channel. And I could have been one of those victims, but I'm still here. I suppose I should be grateful, but I just feel guilty. Am I still here by, by mere luck? Ten months later and I'm back, but now I need to address something else. My email address has been flooded with messages, 
Some people ask me for more details. Some ask if I can upload the tapes. And some people email me claiming to be Mr. Bear. First, I can't get the tapes uploaded as they're A. In police possession as evidence in an ongoing case and B. I have no idea how to transfer VHS on the computer. As for the people pretending to be Mr. Bear, you're not fooling me. When you have dozens of people pretending to be the same person, it doesn't work. I've even seen a fake Caledon 21 YouTube channel, which is cute, but still not real. Even more annoying is the fact that someone hacked into my account just to put up some demented poem about me on this blog. I'll leave it in the entry above this one, just to show you guys. I contacted the webmaster about my entry and I was told that it was posted on Halloween. Oh, spooky. It was attached to the email paintwithb at aol.com. I assume this is another joke email. Anyway, I'm over episode 31 now. Yes, the images of what I saw will stick with me for a while, but... I want to see the other Caledon Local 21 tapes available. I'll get in contact with Mitchell Wilson again and hopefully he can set me up with the tapes in the possession of the other Pill Police branches. I'll try to update you guys as soon as I can. I'm sure it won't take as long this time. Thank you to everyone who still reads this. Elliot We are coming for you We are coming for you We are coming for you We are coming We are coming We are coming for you